Thank you very much. And the full wind turbine. Great. It's a lot more than a Nobel Prize because it's been given to me by my friends. And that's nice. Uh, so, friends, uh, first, in a friendly way, forgive me if I forget to thank someone. Because, you know, friends forgive friends. But uh, the people who made it possible for me to come here, made it reasonable for me to come here, uh, made it irresistible for me to come here. Um, John Renner Hansen, who was the institute leader at the time. Thomas Bjornholm, who was prorector, friend, and now with the Willem Foundation. Lars Kahn Rasmussen and his fantastic family and his fantastic company. The Danish National Research Foundation, who uh, trusted that I would even show up and uh, gave a center to somebody who wasn't even here. So um, I want to end by thanking the Ursa Foundation. It's a hard word to pronounce, Ursa. How am I doing? It's okay. Um, the last couple of weeks, I've spent a long time reading about Hans Christian Urso, and I, uh, I felt I have a lot in common with him. He liked to travel. I like to travel. He was an experimental scientist who believed in the power of experiment. He was also um, somebody who took teaching very seriously. And um, one of the things that I want to emphasize as we go through this talk, particularly because I think that there's a misconception, a misconception created by uh, uh, journalists, I think, are principally responsible for this misconception. Uh, and maybe even artists who create pictures like this of Professor Ursto doing the experiments. Uh, because the last group that I would like to thank are my students. They would say, get your hands off my experiment. And that's exactly the way it should be. It's their experiment, not mine. So I want to thank, because, the, because this prize is not some kind of lifetime achievement award, or it's not a thanks for coming to Denmark award, it's an award for research. It's, a, it's an award for pushing back the frontiers of knowledge, or I guess pushing back the frontiers of ignorance, I suppose, would be the direction that you push. Uh, and that is the responsibility of the students, postdocs, bachelor's students, master's students who are in the lab. And so I particularly would like to say, and I'm seeing some of them sitting up over here, uh, thank you. Thank you to, uh, to them and to all of you for coming tonight. And for many of you who uh, have wound up being my friends, that's very nice. The experiment that put Ursel on the international map is shown here, illustrated uh, with this picture, which doesn't look anything like the sculpture, nor any of the other pictures. So I'm not sure how that, uh, whether that was he. But in fact, the experiment is the important part to look at, running electricity through wire. And here in Ursel's own handwriting, the uh, indicating of what happened, showing that when current ran through the wire, a compass needle would rotate. And here's his diagram showing which way they would rotate depending on which way the wire was going, et cetera. And we come now to understand that as the, the consequence of the creation of a magnetic field. A magnetic field that you can image if you want, and you could have done it then too, which is by sprinkling little pieces of iron around where the electricity is flowing through the wire. And the, electricity, the uh, current will make the, uh, the, the little pieces of metal line up. And we in the physics class teach and remember that we use our right hand to show us what direction the magnetic field goes, that the magnetic field goes in the direction of our fingers when we put our thumb in the direction of the current. And uh, this was a unification that began a process in physics that goes by the name of unification, of recognizing that something and something else aren't different but that they're two sides of something. One doesn't immediately know how many sides it has. Maybe it's like a die, and it has many sides, and you can look at it. But 
Ersted's pleasure was not just the pleasure of an experimenter, and his writing reflects the fact that his pleasure was the pleasure of seeing in somehow three dimensions that magnetism and electricity were two facets of a common object. And that as time went on and other forces were understood and they were made to be other faces of the cube, if you want, with the grand goal of understanding that all of the forces in the universe are faces of a cube. And here's the fun part. We're not done yet. It doesn't quite work. We don't quite know whether that's true. We're in the middle of it right now. This was, as I think everyone appreciates, 200 years ago this year. <coughs> and what I'd like to talk about in this presentation is roughly speaking what happened in the interval between then and now with a particular emphasis on, first of all, Copenhagen, and second of all, magnetism, because that was the key observation of Ursa to begin with. Now, let's see if I can move to the next slide. Yeah, there we go. In the decades that followed Ersted's experimental discovery, the rest of the story was mapped out by uh, names you know, Ampere, Faraday, Maxwell, who ultimately unified into a beautiful framework all of the discoveries of Ersted Arago, Ampere, Faraday, into a single set of equations. And I'm not putting them up there uh, to teach you a bunch of symbols, but rather to show that the entire electromagnetic story not only fit in this beautiful, simple form, but that it was so elegant and so symmetric that it must be right. Think about what that means. That is, and, Ur and Ersted recognized it, and so did Einstein, that that's a statement of biology that I just made. That's a statement about how the brain works. That it's so beautiful and so perfect that it must be right. What does that mean? That problem fascinated Ersted, and he wrote a lot about that question. But here he is, here's Ersted right here. That says that the magnetic field, H, which today carries the units of Ersted's, is related to the current by having this funny symbol in front of it, which means it curls around. Oh, I suppose to use my right hand. It curls around. That symbol, that upside down triangle cross the symbol, is called a curl and it means that the magnetic field is curly. The electric field is also curly, but it depends on the magnetic field changing. Here's Faraday down here. There's Ørsted. There's Maxwell. There's Coulomb. Each came in a different time of history, each seeing one side of the cube, and then finally they fit together in this beautiful exposition. So beautiful, in fact, that you might have th thought, game over. There was another important unification, and I want to tell you about it. And I'm sorry to say, particularly if you're you know, caught off guard by this, this is going to be a physics lecture. So, you know, it's not like you were warned, there's the door. <laughs> the, um, the part of the story that I want to turn to now, if I can get this to go to the next slide, uh, is this thing which you see every day. And it is related to one of those Maxwell equations. It's the one about the changing magnetic field creating a curly E. That was the one that's associated with the name Faraday, but it doesn't matter. Because there's the magnetic field. You see you glue a magnet onto your spokes or you screw the magnet onto your spokes, and every time the magnet changes, it goes around, it makes 
an electric field that charges up a battery inside the light. And the reason that I want to talk about this thing that we see a thousand times a day is because of the next major event in unification of showing the sides of the die. I think I'm going to go stand over here and just do it like this. Now you probably didn't think that when you came to this lecture tonight that we were going to actually read Einstein's papers aloud together, but we're going to. And the crazy thing is, is you're going to understand it perfectly. And that the paper that made Einstein famous, relativity equals mc squared, all that business, started with a paper about the electrodynamics of moving bodies. The magnet tied to the spokes, going around past the light. And here was Einstein's problem and here was the resolution. And it's, what's nice is I'm not going to paraphrase it. I'm just going to read it straight out of the journal. It is known that Maxwell's electrodynamics, as usually understood at the present time, when applied to moving bodies, leads to asymmetries which do not appear inherent in the phenomenon. Take, for example, the reciprocal electrodynamic actions of a magnet and the conductor. The observable phenomenon here depends only on the relative motion of the conductor and the magnet, whereas a customary view draws a sharp distinction between the two causes, between the two cases. Now, here he's saying nothing other than what you obviously expect. The magnet goes around and it passes by the coil. Nobody cares if the coil is moving or the magnet is moving. It's not about the coil moving or the magnet moving. It's that one is moving relative to the other. One passes the other one by. If the magnet is in motion and the conductor is at rest, we get one law of physics. But if the magnet is stationary and the conductor is in motion, no electric field arises and we get a different set of physics. But this can't be. How can they be different if you hold one still and you do this one, or you hold that one still and you do this one? It must be the same physics. There must be something wrong in our understanding of that story. Examples of this sort, together with the unsuccessful attempts to discover any motion of the Earth relative to some medium, suggest that the phenomenon of electrodynamics as well as mechanics possess no properties corresponding to absolute rest. They suggest, rather, as has already been shown to the first order in small quantities, the same law of electrodynamics and optics will be valid for all frames of reference for which the equations of mechanics hold. We raise this conjecture, conjecture, conjecture. Don't know if it's true. We raise this conjecture to the status of a postulate and also introduce another postulate which is only apparently irreconcilable with a former, namely, that the speed of light always propagates in empty space. So, the law of electrodynamics and optics will be the valid for all frames of reference, and light always propagates at the same speed, which is independent of the motion. These two postulates suffice for the attainment of a simple and consistent theory of electrodynamics of moving bodies based on Maxwell's theory. In other words, if we simply say that there's no such thing as whether the magnet's moving or the coil's moving, it only matters whether one is passing the other. We suppose that that's true. And we add one more thing, just to find out what it does. You don't have to say why, just say it's a postulate. Let's just find out what it does. That the speed of light is a constant. And what comes out? Everything. Everything. All of Maxwell's equations just fall on the floor in front of you. And that's what happened in 1905. And now you must think, now physics is done. The whole thing is so beautiful. All we did was we said, motion is relative, and the speed of light is a constant. And all of Maxwell, and the curl, and the J, and the B, and the magnetic field, and the electric field, and the Faraday part, and the Maxwell part, all of that came pouring out. But all was not well, and it's the all that was not well part that also brings us back to Copenhagen. Sometime later, not much later, that was 18, 
1820 that the first was that the that the law was found. 1870 was Maxwell. 1905 was Einstein putting the whole thing together. But already there was rumbling on the horizon. I'm going to focus on the rumbling, particularly in the context of magnetism. There was rumbling in other domains as well. But let's focus on the rumbling associated with magnetism. This guy, Peter Zeman, found something when he put the, the bright light that came when you put a piece of sodium in a, fi a flame, he also put it in a magnetic field, and he looked at what color came out, and he found that the lines split into something that was called the anomalous Zeman effect, after his last name, Zeman. Down below Bohr, in the 1920s is Wolfgang Pauli. You've probably heard the name from the Pauli exclusion principle and Pauli matrices and Pauli statistics. Look at the expression on his face. Here from Pauli's writing some years later, a colleague who met me strolling rather aimlessly in the beautiful streets of Copenhagen said to me, you look, who said to me in a very friendly manner, you look very unhappy. Whereupon I answered him fiercely, how can one look happy when he is thinking about the anomalous Zeman effect? <laughs> so there were troubles following even the beautiful synthesis of Einstein. Here are more magnetic troubles. It seems to be getting closer and louder. I mean, I wouldn't worry about it, except it was, it's getting closer. OK. Yeah, and it's OK? It's OK. Um, here's another magnetic bit of trouble. If you take atoms that are, uh, that are uh, heat up something, in this case it was silver. You heat up silver and silver atoms come flying off, they kind of evaporate off, and uh, you put them through a magnetic field, and it had been predicted by Bohr's model of the atom, the famous quantized orbits of 1913 in the Bohr model of the atom, that the atoms of silver flying through not a magnetic field, but a gradient of magnetic field, a changing magnetic field, high on the top, low on the bottom, would be bent. And that even though the atoms were tumbling and going flying at every random order, the prediction was made that they would be quantized into different segments, and they would fly north and fly south. And in fact, the experimentalists, Stern and Gerlach, now everyone knows the Stern-Gerlach experiment, everyone studies it in their physics class, found that, in fact, those atoms were sent into two separate piles. Now, that's odd, isn't it? Because if they're coming out in all random order, you would think they would fly all over the place, like what you might expect to form a blob. But they didn't. They flew up and they flew down. And at the time, Gerlach wrote a letter to Professor Niels Bohr in Copenhagen. That's all you needed, I guess, at the time. He's famous enough that you just write Professor Niels Bohr, Copenhagen. Oh no, this is, this is Stockholm's Gala, right? Stockholm's Gala 37, where is that? Is that, that's where he lived? Yeah, okay. So he writes, attached is the experimental proof of, the, of direction quantization. We congratulate you on the, on the confirmation of your theory. Famous experiment, and these are the famous data. Every textbook has that data in it. And it's wrong. I mean, the data's not wrong but it has nothing to do with Bohr's atom. Because in fact, silver, the atom that they used, doesn't have a magnetic moment from the orbit. It was something else. There was something else going on, but the something else wasn't known at the time. The something else that was going on is called spin. And it says that the electron itself, not just going around in the Bohr orbit, as we learned, but itself, has a magnetic moment. And it was that magnetic moment that was responsible for the splitting. Now this spin business was a complicated 
and somewhat unfortunate history. Here in the front row of Auditorium A, with Bohr at the end of the row, I try going back over here, is the inventor or the discoverer of spin. A name probably you don't know, Ralph Kronig, who went on to a distinguished career, eventually becoming rector of Delft University, but at the time, he missed the mark. He missed the mark by perfectly understanding that there must be something else in hypothesizing, that in addition to Bohr's orbit, that the electron itself had a magnetic moment. But the mistake that he made, and I'm talking to my students now, is that he went to his elders and he said, what do you think about this idea? And they said, it's garbage. And he said, okay, and he didn't publish it. And a year later, two young Dutch physicists published the same idea. And from what I've heard, when asked the question of Goodsmith and Uhlenbeck, but weren't you off by a factor of two? Didn't you, didn't, didn't you have to take into account some, some missing factor of two? And they looked at each other and said, factor of two? They'd missed the factor of two, which turned out to be something called the Thomas precession, which gives the exact factor of two that one needs. But poor Kronig missed it. And that's why this f amazing property of electrons has no Nobel Prize. It was just a simply an awkward situation in which the real discoverer had not published it because he went to Pauli and Bohr and Ehrenfest, and they said, it's probably not right. And Uhlenbeck and Goodsmith didn't go to anybody. Point taken? So all was not well. You can see from their faces that all was not well. And I want to say beside missing spin, which was absent from the interpretation of the anomalous Zeeman effect, it was Pauli eventually who bothered as he walked through the streets of Copenhagen, solved the problem. It was also Pauli, by the way, who told Kronig not to publish. That's interesting. But there's a bigger problem, and the problem is so profound that to this day we don't really have anything more to say about it. I go back to the slide, and I'm going to do it in the context of magnetism. I go back to the slide about the stern gerlach machine, which had the gradient of magnetic field that separated the part into the two piles. And it's interesting to read Bohr's response to Gerlach, who wrote the postcard to him, and said, I would be very grateful if you or Stern could let me know in a few lines whether you interpret your experimental results in a way that the atoms are oriented only parallel or opposed, but not normal to the field. One could then, try, one could then provide theoretical reasons for the latter assertion. Wow, something had dawned on both Einstein and Bohr about this experiment that was real trouble. Here's the problem. They put the magnet in and the spots go up and down. What if they put the thing in like that, sideways? Then somehow that stream of atoms would know what question they were being asked by the apparatus and they would have given one of two answers. If they're asked this question, they answer up or down. If they're asked this question, they answer left and right. How did they know what to answer? Did they have the answer to all possible questions? You can imagine putting it at 45 degrees and asking the question again. Now life gets very difficult when all of a sudden the answer to a yes, no question depends on the question that you ask. Sure. 
Einstein, some years later, made this problem extremely difficult. The challenge that Einstein posed that led in this paper with his co-authors Podolsky and Rosen led to the conclusion that the description of reality as given by this wave function, this quantum mechanical object, it's not wrong, it's just not the whole story. There must be more going on. It's not a complete picture of everything that can be known about that physical system. The argument went something like this. Take those two stern gerlach machines and create a system in which there's a correlation between the two outcomes of the experiment. Don't measure it on one and then later turn it sideways. Create something like, if you take a helium atom, the two electrons in a helium atom point up and down. Oh, now you're a smart audience. You say, what do you mean up and down? Do you mean left and right? Do you mean 45 and not 45? Or do you mean up and down? Exactly, that's the problem. And now instead of doing that, you separate the two electrons and send them off to the far sides of the galaxy. And out there they run into Bob, who looks a little bit like Bob Dylan, and Alice, who looks a little bit like Alice in Wonderland. And the helium atoms have taken a long time to send their electrons in the different directions. And meanwhile, Alice orients her stern gerlach machine in one orientation and asks a question of her electron that comes. Are you up or are you down? And the electron says, what do you mean up or down? And she says, the way my machine is pointing, that's what I mean. And it says, oh, okay, up. Now, I said they were opposite. That means the one heading toward Bob knows the answer to the question, what direction are you pointing? And the answer is, the opposite of whatever direction her machine was pointing in. And Bob measures accordingly. And how long exactly did it take for her to get the information, for, for Bob, sorry, to get the information about the orientation of her machine? Seemingly no time at all. That is, not limited by the speed of light. The same year that Einstein wrote that paper saying something has got to be wrong with this story, Bohr wrote a paper with the same title, single author, in which he stated, in fact, this new feature of natural philosophy means a radical revision of our attitude as regards physical reality. It was clear that this was not a discussion about physics experiments. This was a discussion about everything. About the idea that something far away does something and instantaneously it becomes correlated with what happens somewhere else. That doesn't feel like the world we grew up in and it didn't feel like the world that Bohr and Einstein had grown up in. For the next 30 years, this problem sat as a philosophical conundrum. Well, quantum mechanics passed every test that it was put to, but there was this bothersome grain, which was, if you did something over here, does it really correlate with something over there? Is that really what quantum mechanics says? And then maybe somebody else you haven't heard of, John Bell, recognized that in fact, this idea of send it over there and make the machine and make this measurement was something that could actually be reduced to an experiment that one could do. And it had very concrete predictions. You can even look at the, at the blackboard. And it said that if you measure these various probabilities coming off of this machine that he sketched on the board, if you're with Einstein that the story doesn't make any sense, that inequality has to be less than two if everything is a complete story and on board and we measure and it's there. But quantum mechanics says it is definitely not less than, two, than less than two. So now it becomes a doable experiment. And if you read the quote from John Bell at the bottom, 
He says, I don't know any conception of locality, meaning that the properties of something are what you have in your hands. The properties can depend on something at the other side of the galaxy. I don't know any conception of locality which works with quantum mechanics. So I think we're stuck with non-locality. The world is a complicated place. Naturally, although it took 10 years for the first experiments to appear, people started measuring whether this crazy story was true. And from then until now, every time someone measures whether or not a setting over here affects an outcome over there, the same result is found, which is that seems to be the world we live in. Which brings me back, in a way, to the point that I made earlier, a point that fascinated Urso, namely, this is a statement of biology. The notion that something does or doesn't feel right to us, like Maxwell's equations were so beautiful, how could they be wrong? Or this is so idiotic, how could it be right? is a statement of biology. That's about us and our brains, not about physics. And in some way, it was Bohr who led, saying, get over it. Now, let's take it seriously and ask, like an engineer might, yeah, it's weird. It's hard to understand. It doesn't make that much sense. Is it good for anything? What can I make that couldn't be made before if I take advantage of that? Let's assume it's right and put it to work for us. Well, if I take something which is a, like a, a chip inside of a computer and I take a transistor that's on one of those chips and I say that it can be in a state of being both in a superposition of its possible states. I know that because if I send a beam in to a Stern-Gerlach machine, it splits up into two halves, irrespective of what direction I send in. So I have to assume that each one is in a possible superposition of both possible states. Whether it's a silver atom flying through a field gradient or a transistor on a chip, it should be described by the same quantum mechanics. So I should be able to say, well, let's describe the transistor as on and off at the same time. And now I can ask the question, if in fact it was on and off at the same time, and that one transistor lets electricity flow, and simultaneously, of course, does not let electricity flow, to another transistor which turns on because the electricity has charged up its capacitor plate, and of course, simultaneously, not turned on because it's simultaneously not getting its capacitor plate charged up, which then lets electricity flow to another transistor or not, etc. What would that be like? And there, I'm sorry to say, we have to stop the story. Because the answer is, nobody knows. Nobody's ever built it before. That's never happened. Nobody has never controlled the flow of this quantum entanglement that correlates one state with another. It happens in nature. In fact, it's an intrinsic part of the quantum mechanics that we know. But nobody's ever mastered it and controlled it. Now, you could ask all sorts of interesting questions, like, what if I had superposition, zeros and ones at the same time, but no entanglement? I didn't let the zero and one turn on another transistor that went somewhere else. Could I use it for making a kind of computer, or do I need the entanglement? And if I have the entanglement, what kind of computer problems can I solve if I have that instead of the other? So all of these constitute a new branch of information theory called quantum information theory that asks the question, given the various aspects of quantum physics that we've talked about, which ones are empowering and which ones are just along for the ride? 
And if it were known, I would tell you. But it's not known. And with each quantum algorithm that is found that seems to be able to do something that takes advantage of quantum mechanics, it has to be examined again whether or not that algorithm uses superposition or entanglement or all of the aspects. And how much entanglement? Can it be a small amount of entanglement? If there's n transistors, can it be an entanglement which is like 1 over n or 1 over n squared or some very small amount? All of these constitute a new branch of theoretical science, I guess I would call it mathematics. But I, like I said, am an experimentalist. And so I want to build these things and find out what they do when we put them to work. There are several approaches. I'll talk about two. One of them is not even listed here. We could follow Pauli and use the spinning electron as a bit just like sending it through the Stern-Gerlach machine, except doing it on a chip instead of through free space. That works. Those are called spin qubits, spin quantum bits. And there are several researchers over in our center that are working on spin qubits. This one's more up Ersted's alley. This is current flowing in a wire. But if I don't measure what direction it's flowing, if I don't put a compass needle there, then I could say it could be flowing this way and flowing that way at the same time. It could be in a superposition of clockwise and counterclockwise currents. I'll focus a little more effort on that. And finally, I could be uh, not like Pauli and not like Ersted, but I could be like Bohr, and I could use the levels of an atom, the, the orbitals of the atom to constitute the, the levels of the bit and make a superposition of being in two different ones at the same time. I'm for the moment going to focus on superconductors. And I'll try to go a little bit quickly. The superconducting circuits that I'm going to be talking about are things that are standard, I would even say high school electricity and magnetism. They are the so-called LC circuit. The inductor is an L. There's Ersted in red. There's the wire with the red magnetic field around it right there. There's a capacitor where the charge accumulates. And if I let the electricity go between magnetic field and electric field and magnetic field and electric field, it looks just like a mass on a spring, where a mass on a spring, you exchange potential energy with kinetic energy. Potential energy kinetic energy. Same thing here. Ersted's magnetic field is the kinetic energy. The capacitor's charge is the potential energy. And the bouncing ball just makes these. In quantum mechanics, it produces solutions that have equal space energy levels called photons. So those individual levels are the same. Now, in the qubits that we want to make, we don't want all of those levels. We don't want an infinite number of photons. We just want two levels, up and down. We want the stern gerlach beam to split into two. So we replace Ersted's inductor with something called a Josephson device. It's just a different symbol. And instead of being a pendulum like this, it's a pendulum like this. They're almost the same. You know, if you ever solved this problem, you saw that this pendulum swings back and forth, this pendulum bobs up and down, and you say, what's the difference between a pendulum that goes like this and a pendulum that goes like this? Not that much, except if it's your kid and he's on the swing and he's going very high and he says, Dad, I'm going to go all the way over. And you say, don't go all the way over. That's a bad idea because this one changes as you get higher and higher, it becomes easier and easier to go all the way over. And he can go all the way over on the swing. Because the potential energy doesn't keep going up like a parabola like it does in the spring case. It starts off like a parabola and it gets a little bit softer. This circuit, which is the electrical analog of the pendulum, only lets two levels communicate. And that's the one we have to build. So we're going to make a swing, not a spring, and we're going to make it out of wires. We make a Josephson junction by putting two pieces of aluminum together. We put those on a circuit, and I want to mention that we always do this out of aluminum. 
That's right, aluminum, first found by Hans Christian Ersted in 1895, five years after his discovery of electromagnetism. What's that? 1825. Oh, yeah. I won't fix it. I'm going to just, just say it, yeah. 1825, right. There are some magic properties of aluminum that are a fantastic story. It's a miracle material. And you ask the question, how long does the, does the pendulum swing? How long does the swing set go? And you can ask if I can make it so that if I just send it like a, like a good pendulum on your watch, it can go 1,000 times or 10,000 times or some large number of times back and forth for some long duration of time. And what's interesting is that the longer that time is, the longer you can keep the system in this quantum unmeasured state. So one, you make it out of aluminum, because aluminum is a magic metal. It's, it's not really known why it's magic, actually. People have tried other metals, but aluminum works best. And you cool it down near absolute zero, and you put it in a light tight box, and you don't let anybody look at it. You do what Bohr would tell you to do. Don't measure it. Don't measure the system. Leave it unmeasured. Don't measure it with temperature. Don't measure it with light. Don't measure it with anything. Cool it down and leave it alone, and it will stay in a superposition for a long time. That's the ingredient that you need. Now, fast forward 40 years of hard work to last year where this finally uh, hit pay dirt for Google, in this case, with a demonstration of an algorithm that was essentially undoable using a classical machine, but using these Josephson qubits could be made. And I'll just read you the red underlining. Our Sycamore processor, that was the name of the chip that they made with 53 of these quantum bits on it. The Sycamore processor takes about 200 seconds to sample one instance, uh, the, to sample uh, um, uh, one instance of a quantum circuit a million times. Uh, the equivalent task for a state-of-the-art classical supercomputer would take approximately 10,000 years. So for once, they've done something that you just couldn't do on a regular computer. Just couldn't do it. Well, you could wait 10,000 years, but otherwise you just couldn't do it. It wasn't a very useful problem, but that doesn't matter. A threshold had been crossed. A calculation had been done on this chip that took 200 seconds, that if you tried to use all the supercomputers in the world, would take you 10,000 years. Here's the lead author visiting us in Copenhagen. Uh, it is important to point out, and I'll, and I'll uh, point it out now, and I'm live streaming and everyone can watch it. Um, Google, IBM, Microsoft, Intel, but these guys are all our friends. We've worked for them a lot longer. We've, I mean, we've worked with each other a lot longer than any of us have worked for companies. So they come and visit, they meet with our students, they write on the blackboard, they explain what they're doing. We're just a bunch of physicists trying to discover what happens out there and uh, the companies are along for the ride. At the end, and I've got about 10 minutes left, I want to change direction a little bit and talk about a different kind of qubit, one that was not in my list, and one that you probably wouldn't think of. It's a weird one, and it happens to be the one that I and the lab are spending a lot of time working on, and it's based on an idea. And the idea is very much like this measurement thing where, I, where the information was stored non-locally in this entangled problem, and I do something over here and it affects something over there. And here's the idea. If I have a, for instance, a rope, and I can only look locally with a magnifying glass at some little piece of the rope, like say I'm, an, I'm a little ant and I'm walking on the rope and I have a magnifying glass and I can only look where I am, and I ask the question, is the rope tied in a knot or, or is it not tied in a knot? I can't tell from a local measurement. I walk along and I walk along and I can't keep track of whether I went under and over and all of that stuff, whether if I pull the two ends it'll come out or not. That's something that you have to step back and you have to look at the thing non-locally to understand the topological structure of the long rope. So the idea, the hypothesis is that 
No local measurement can measure whether the rope is knotted, and therefore any information that is encoded in the knot structure of something can't be measured locally, and therefore will not lose its quantum coherence to a measurement. The measurement relaxes this superposition, and this one will be immune. Immune. This was turned into a scheme of computing, quantum computing, called topological quantum computing, using the topological structure of quantum mechanical objects to encode information. And uh, uh, the authors listed here, the first, Mike Friedman, uh, Fields Medal winning mathematician, here he is uh, literally hanging around Copenhagen uh, and uh, during a visit. And in this paper from 2002, they point out this point, the chief advantage of this so-called anionic computing, this is using these, these uh, structures that can be tied in a knot, uh, would be physical error correction. That is, you can't decohere the system in its intrinsic form. You don't have to be smart about removing errors. The system itself is intrinsically immune to errors. That's a very attractive idea. And something which, among others, the Nobel Committee has recognized, if I read to you from the 2016 Nobel Prize, topological insulators, topological superconductors, and topological metals are now being talked about. Uh, these are areas which, over the last decade, have defined frontline research in condensed matter physics, not least because of the hope that topological materials will be useful for a new generation of electronics and superconductors, or in future, quantum computers. And it was that idea that uh, was so amply rewarded and has generated so much activity. The simplest version of this encoding is to put the information in two places. Don't spread it all out in some complicated thing that's tied to knot. Just take the information and separate it. A little bit like those necklaces that you, you give your best friend. And the information about what it says, I mean, if you have the end that says st end, you can figure out probably. But you don't know until the other side comes together and puts it together and contains the information when the two halves go. And we want to do that with an electron. We want to find out whether we can encode information in an electron and then, like the necklaces, separate the information so that no local measurement can detect the information. That makes a qubit that if anybody is down there, you know, banging on that end of the wire, they can't do anything to the information because it's half somewhere else. And that's the important challenge. But it, now it becomes a problem in condensed matter physics, where the mathematics of tying a complex wave function into a knot meets, how do you make the damn thing? So here's Carson Flensburg and Mike Friedman, the mathematician and the condensed matter theorist, wrestling about whether or not a particular physical system will implement this idea. And it turns out, as luck would have it, the University of Copenhagen is one of those places where these materials happen to be a specialty. Here from Jesper Newgard's group, Peter Krogstrup and um, um, Madsen. What's his first name, Peter? Morton. Morton Madsen, who's now, who's now back with us. Uh, uh, growing wires that can become the things with the red balls at the end. A long story that I would like to go quickly through is that over the intervening 10 years since that idea was written down, tie it in a knot and you won't be able to detect it, a series of experiments have begun, beginning with this one from my friend and colleague Leo Cowenhoven in Delft and his group, uh, showing signatures of the presence of that red ball at the end. You know, it's a whole game you have to play about, okay, there's a red ball there. Well, that's just a PowerPoint picture. It's not actually a red ball. It's something you have to measure and find out whether or not that state is there down at the end of the wire. And this signature, if I point to this unexpected appearance of a feature, was what was the original signature of these so-called Majorana fermions in these superconductor-semiconductor junctions. The next important step came from Peter Krogstrup, who's sitting up here in the audience, uh, which was the development of a material 
that married the two key ingredients necessary to make this topological material. The material is on the top, our favorite superconductor, aluminum, and on the bottom, a semiconductor that is the basis of all of our transistors uh, in the world. And what you'll notice, and this had never happened before, is the ability to grow these in a perfect crystal with atomic registry at the interface between those two materials. That gave Copenhagen a, a path forward which has now been duplicated by other places in the world. But it got us started making qubits right off the bat, and I'm going to quickly go to the kinds of devices that we started making to test some of these crazy ideas. So here, using the aluminum shown in blue, discovered by Ersten, covered with hafnium, the element predicted by Bohr, on top of the superconductor-semiconductor junction grown by Peter Krogstrup, making the first topological transistor in the lab, in the H.C. Ersted lab. That device sits on a chip. The chip is bonded up with electrical connections that sit in the middle of a metal container that goes into the bottom of a refrigerator that gets buttoned up and cooled to a hundredth of a degree above absolute zero just to make the measurement safer for the protected quantum information. I know that I said you could go bang at the one end and it wouldn't make any difference. But it's better to keep it cool anyway. Now, the problem with the theoretical physics community is that they don't wait for you to get to step A before they write down what you're supposed to do for step B. And right now, the theoretical community is at about step Z. And they've, they've said, well, as long as that's going to work, here's how you can build the whole rest of the computer. When you get those little red balls, make a million of them. And move them all around, and that'll compute. It sounds, uh, it's harder than it sounds. But the important breakthrough came with a next kind of material that brought this superconductor semiconductor junctions into the two dimensions so that we could actually use a lithographic process to produce, if you want, a million of these. You don't have to put the individual wires down. And those processes allowed us to start fabricating instead of growing the individual wires. Finally, and it's just about time to stop, there's a hard problem I haven't even mentioned. How do you control all of this? Every one of those transistors has to be lifted and operated in it, and it turns out that's just as hard of a control problem for quantum computing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end with the following observation. Tonight we're being, I'm being honored by the Society for the Dissemination of Scientific Knowledge. This is not the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. That was what was going on in Britain. That was also what was going on in Boston. That was also what was going on in the United States in general, was the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge. But Ersted insisted that this not be about useful knowledge, that this be about the exploration of the beauty of science, and that useful knowledge would be a byproduct, one might even say an accidental byproduct, of the search for beauty in the world as physicists and chemists and biologists and in general scientists. So, when I put a slide up about the billion euro boost, Ersted is disgusted. And he says that's not what it's about. Although Ersted liked scientific equipment also, and so I want to end with a mentioning, I'll just mention one. Actually, you know what, I'm going to, for, the, for fun of it, I'm going to skip this one and, and, uh, and go to this one instead. 
Imagine a single power cable capable of carrying the, in, the combined output of several nuclear power stations over long distances with no losses that minimal and minimal environmental impact. That's the possible offering of superconducting technology and it could help overcome one of the major barriers to Europe's successful energy transition to sustainable low carbon generation. This is from a company called Nexans, partnered with Ørsted, Ørsted the company, not Ørsted the person, to put a subsea cable down. The cable involves the use of cryogens to make the superconductor because superconductors only exist at low temperature. Except if you happen to be reading Nature magazine this week, in which a room temperature superconductor was announced. What? A room temperature superconductor? Doesn't that change everything? Yes and no. The room temperature superconductor required 267 gigapascals of pressure. Now, that pressure is available, that pressure is available at the center of the Earth, but it's not available here at the surface. So then you say, well, I don't know, is that good news or bad news? I think it's good news. There is now, now, a room temperature superconductor. Okay, it's got some problems, but who doesn't? <laughs> But if you ask the question, could we have predicted that material? Could we have gone looking for that material and known that it was there? This material, which is basically like smelly water. You know, it's, it's H2, instead of H2O, just go one row down on the periodic table, H2S, hydrogen sulfide. You know the stuff from chemistry class that smells so bad. And you put hydrogen in there and it, and it takes one more hydrogen, so it's H3S, and then that thing, if you put it under pressure, so the last hydrogen goes in the middle of the, of the crystal, superconducts. Could that have been calculated? Well, if I read from the people who calculate these things, on the computational side, the high throughput sweep of databases or, or uh, stochastic searches has become relatively routine. However, the computation of the critical temperature has not. The most reliable results require care and very large computer resources. So you could ask the question, what if you had a quantum computer? Could you calculate this with a quantum computer? And this then from my friends at Microsoft is a research problem that they're working on. And if I read to you in red, the use of a quantum computer enables much larger and more accurate simulations than with any known classical algorithm and will allow many open questions in quantum materials to be resolved. So the answer, I think, is maybe. And I'd like to end this talk with that spirit of maybe by reading a short story, if I can, from Hans Christian Ersted, uh, Hans Christian Andersen, friend of Hans Christian Ersted, little Hans Christian, he was called. And this is called In a Thousand Years. Yes, in a thousand years, people will fly on the wings of steam through the air over the oceans. The young inhabitants of America will become visitors of old Europe. The ship of the air comes. It's crowded with passengers, for the transit is quicker than by sea. The electromagnetic wire under the ocean. You're probably putting that in right now. The electromagnetic wire under the ocean has already telegraphed the number of the aerial caravan. Europe is in sight. It is the coast of Ireland that they see, but the passengers are still asleep. They won't be called till they're exactly over England. One day devoted to seeing Germany, one day for the north, the countries of Ørsted and Linnaeus, and for Norway, the land of the old heroes and the young Normans. Iceland is visited on the journey home. Now keep in mind, this was 50 years before the flight at Kitty Hawk. But, it didn't take a thousand years. He was off by a factor of 10. So when you hear these stories about everything from controlled quantum entanglement, spooky action at a distance in our control, to computing which materials will make room temperature superconductors, to even the parts I skipped about quantum chemistry 
in quantum biology. We can be good at predicting the future, but often we underestimate, not overestimate, we underestimate how quickly we'll get there. So I think I will take this prize on behalf of my friends, my students, and my inherited country. And uh, thank you for your attention, and thank you all very much for this great honor. Also, some questions for you. And uh, we have someone with a microphone here, and please recall if you want to ask a question. And if you don't want to be live streamed, you have to say so. <laughs> so, nobody there. Yeah. This is very unusual in our society. <laughs> Is it the live streaming that's keeping you back? Okay, famous. Thank you for a very uh, interesting lecture. Thank you. Um, you started halfway or third way through about two ele electrons being uh, entangled. Can there be more than two electrons being entangled together? Yes. In fact, if there are more than two electrons involved in some s system, which is the usual case, it's, it's, it's either a thought experiment or a crazily controlled physics experiment to only have two electrons. So the situation you're asking about is the generic situation. Then they will all be entangled with each other. One important difficulty, two, two difficulties that I would like to mention with that situation. One is how do you quantify the degree of entanglement? When there are two particles involved, then you can write down something which says this is how entangled they are and they're l less than zero and more than maximal, et cetera. Once three or more particles are involved in the entanglement, the measure of entanglement itself becomes a complicated problem. And in fact, some measures of entanglement aren't even, if I can say it this way, it's slightly mathematically, they're not even monotonic functions of each other. One of them's going up while the other one's going down. So it becomes a confused problem just how to handle it mathematically. Once you reach the thermodynamic limit and you have 10 to the 23 that are involved, then it again becomes simpler. But I want to make an important distinction, and this is the second point that I want to make, which is I would like to distinguish between massive entanglement and decoherence. Because decoherence itself is a kind of entanglement with everybody. So I would like an entanglement which is spread out, but not out of control. And that's something which has never been achieved. And, and uh, is really the main goal of this thing. So yes, uh, that's, that's on the, that's on the, the plan. Highly unusual. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Klaus. Uh, maybe you, you need the microphone for the live streaming. Thank, Thank you for fully living up to our expectations about the Rusted Gold Medal Lecture. And of course, the, the question I will have of looking at your last slide will it be in my lifetime? It. Thank it. You. <laughs> You know, Bill, Bill Clinton once asked the question, it depends on what you mean by is, I think was the way he said it. So I'm going to say, it depends on what you mean by it. Because what you could say is, we already have quantum computers. I showed you the d data from Google. I can even show you, you can go log on tonight and, and, and go use one. Let me see if the question that you're asking is, when will we have quantum computers that can solve useful problems that can't be solved other ways. Is that a, is that a, f it's a pretty narrow slice of a question, but that's I think the question that you're asking. I don't know. <laughs> the, uh, but, but you look pretty young. I think it will be within your life. Thank you. Yeah. Well, 
it seems you emptied out the subject. <laughs> so um, let us uh, let us uh, give you a small gift. I understood you read about us. Then. I don't know if you read this book. This is a newly produced one that we based on on our magazine Quent, uh, and with a couple more articles, people Thank looking you. at us there from a new viewpoint, perhaps in some ways. And then, of course, since Arsted also was oh, very great. inspiring for the breweries, you know, there's this special beer that has been brewed this year. I didn't which know. Which, unfortunately, um, wasn't launched in April because of the COVID pandemic. And so now it's uh, actually only just come out in the big bottles, the small bottles we would normally serve here mm. at our lectures and at the lectures in the Royal Academy. But tonight we are not allowed to because of the COVID pandemic. So I'm sorry, I mean, there will be no beer for you <laughs> in the audience, but there will be a beer for you, Charlie. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks. So thank you to everyone, yeah. and remember,